Amen. All right, here we go. As you know, I am a technical person. And when I uploaded my file this morning, I put it in the computer, and everything looked great. Until just now. So (laughs) everything, I had to go and change stuff around. But uh, we we are good this morning. So, so what do you think of the uh, of the new Christmas look? Mm. Wednesday evening, we uh, we had a group of people here, and uh, instead of having service, we opened up with a couple of uh, a couple of Christmas songs, and then we uh, instead of learning about the Lord, we were exhibiting. Uh, our, our faith in him. We were serving, and uh, it, uh, it could not have gotten to this point without, uh, without a concerted effort from a large number of people. So I thank you, and uh, we get to enjoy this for the next few months. So, well, no. Christmas is this month. We'll figure that out. <clears throat> if it's up to me, I'd keep it up till Easter, and then we'd just put a cross up there, you know. But hey... <clears throat> You know me and Christmas. Christmas is my favorite time of the year, and it has nothing to do with gifts. It has all to do with the gift. It has all to do with Jesus Christ and who he is to me. So I, I just love going all out for Christmas because, it, you, you know, there's those stores that pop up all over the place. with uh, hol- um, Halloween something. Oh, Spirit Halloween. Yes. We had one right up here, right up the street that opened up. Spirit Halloween. They opened up just for Halloween. I like the ones that stay open year-round and say the Christmas tree shop, you know, because that's just, that's year-round. We get to think about Christmas and think about Jesus, and I, I just absolutely love it. So I can talk all day about Christmas, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to bore you with that, although it's uh, not boring. But uh, in any case, all right. So last week we began talking about tunnel vision. Voila, tunnel vision, it's working. And if we are living, breathing human beings, which I hope all of us are, unless you are new to Earth, welcome. If you are watching us from another galaxy online, we welcome you for joining us uh, here this morning. We hope one day you will join us here physically. But in any case, if you are living, breathing, you are human, you deal with tunnel vision. You have to deal with tunnel vision. Now, Webster's Dictionary defines tunnel vision as this, a medical condition in which you can see things that are straight in front of you, but not to the side, which is a constriction of the visual field resulting in the loss of peripheral vision. Number two is a tendency to think about only one thing and to ignore everything else. It's an extreme narrowness of viewpoint. It's being single-minded and concentrating on only one objective. Now, sometimes we can be so focused on the here and now, so focused on the small percentage of what lies in front of us, that we lose sight of the big picture and can't see the Lord's hand of blessing in our lives. Now, it doesn't matter where you are in your relationship with the Lord. This is something that every one of us have to deal with. Every one of us have to overcome come and work through every day of our life. Now, last week, I shared a couple of stories about my boys, Zachary and Caleb. And uh, I I shared a story about Caleb, how he got so excited in Walmart, and I had no idea what he was getting excited about. And when I got done, uh, Sarah reminded me I had pictures of this, because we, we were in Walmart, and I said, you know what? This is a great sermon illustration, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take pictures of it. So, Zach, uh, Caleb is in the cart, and this is what we passed by. It was just a rack of cards, and I did count them. There were 64 cards there. So out of 64 cards, he happens to see what's right here. He happens to see the top, the top of a Thomas the Train card. Just the top. Not even half the card, just the top. And he starts getting ecstatic. He starts getting excited, starts climbing out of the carriage. And, and I said to myself, you know what? He suffers from toddler tunnel vision. It's only Thomas the Trains. Thomas the Trains. And then this, the story about Zachary where he didn't see the truck. He saw the soccer ball. You know, he didn't see the two-ton truck sitting there. He sees a soccer ball in the background. It's because of his tunnel, uh, his tunnel vision. 
So anyway, I just wanted to share those pictures with you because it kind of puts it into, into perspective. When we, when we look at the big picture, we see 64 cards, but for that person who suffers from tunnel vision, they see just the one. They see what is, what is directly in front of them. It might be in front of you too, but you're not tuned in to exactly what that other person is tuned into. So. So I thought that was cute, so I thought I'd, uh, I'd share that with you because my kids actually crack me up sometimes. So, Now, a few days after this happened, I was driving through town with Zachary, and uh, we happened to drive by the Hackettstown station on the other side of town. And uh, so every time we pass by that station... I say, Zach, look at this, it's Hackettstown Station, he loves the trains, we stop for a while, we pull in the driveway, do a couple of figure eights and leave, you know, so he could see the train. So this day, we're passing by, and I said, Zach, Zach, look, where, you know where we're at? And he goes, yeah, Vickerstown. For all of you who don't have toddlers into Thomas, Vickerstown, I, I, I had to look it up for myself, and I, and I, here it is. Vickerstown is located somewhere in England. The Vickerstown Zach was talking about is a fictitious town on the eastern side of Sodor, which is where Thomas the Train lives. <laughs> As you can imagine, I calmly laughed to myself and then told him, no, no, while this is like Vickerstown, this is actually Hackettstown Station. This is the one we pass every, every other day. Oh, my goodness. I've taken him by there at least a dozen times, and I ask him the same question all the time, but I always give him the answer. That time I said, hey, I'm going to wait to see what he says now. I, we've, we've gone through this routine. I never expected to get Vickerstown, so I don't know. He could still think he's in Vickerstown. I have no idea. But, uh, hey... Whatever, whatever makes him happy, he, uh, he likes his Thomas the Train. So, in any case, that's his, uh, that's his form of tunnel vision. Because when you have, when you are inflicted with tunnel vision, you only see what's directly in front of you. Remember last week I said, when, I, when I'm standing here, and, and I didn't even realize what was happening, I stood here, and I put my, put my hands up, and I could not see what's to the side of me. And for those of you who haven't been here in a few weeks, you notice that we have a new baby grand piano. But I couldn't see it because my eye, I was suffering from tunnel vision. But when I open, when I release that myself from that tunnel vision, I see that we have this nice new baby grand piano that was given to us by Mountaintop Church at the top of the hill. And... Um, it was, uh, it, it was great. It was a blessing for us because these are one of the things that I have, have wanted for quite some time. But, um, you know, it's not something you go out and spend $8,000 on, especially when you don't have the 8000 You know, there's always other things you can do with it. But in any case, this was free. We actually uh, got rid of our upright piano and traded for that. And I'd say we traded up. So, uh, so that was a, a huge blessing for us. But, uh, but because I had my hands up, I did not see God's blessing. I prohibited myself from seeing God's blessing. And, and that's one of the effects of tunnel vision. You, you, can't, you can't experience God's blessing because you're, you're restricted from it. Because you're only focusing on a, a, about 20% is just what's right, right in front of you. Now, last week we took a look at David in 2 Samuel chapter 11, and we found out that even though David was a man after God's own heart, David made some bad choices in life. As we all do, he was human. He, he made some bad choices in life, but he was human. He wasn't exempt from tunnel vision. While David was a brave shepherd, a courageous warrior, a passionate worship leader, he's one of my favorite Bible characters, he was also a great king. But he was just like us, and being human, he had to deal with his tunnel vision. And what's more, because he didn't deal with his tunnel vision properly, he let it overtake him for a period of time, and it eventually it developed into something unthinkable and unexpected from such a mighty man of God. Because we like to think of David as this great man of God who never sinned. When David has, has committed some incredible, incredible sins, and in this case, he had committed adultery, caused someone else to have a, a child at a wedlock, and then he wound up killing her husband so he can have his wife. That sounds like a bad, bad man. That is not 
A man who you would describe as a man after God's own heart. But the fact of the matter is, David was human. David was human. And you know what that tells me? Is that if somebody who, who wrote, wrote so many so many hymns that we sing to this day, so many choruses. He was a worshiper. He worshiped the Lord. But a moment of indiscretion, if not dealt with, turns into a life of consequence. But because of his his moments of tunnel vision, he didn't deal with it properly. And because he didn't deal with it properly, it escalated into something that he didn't want, where he didn't want it to go. So if you weren't here last week, I encourage you to read 2 Samuel chapter 11, but don't stop at chapter 11, because 11 is all the doom and gloom. When you read chapter 12, it goes into the redemption process and what, what David went through after that child was born and, and how God redeemed him. And he once again became a man after, after God's own heart. So, you know, it doesn't matter where you're at today, what you've done even this week or this morning for that matter. We serve a God who forgives, a God who restores, a God who redeems us. So I, I am encouraged by, by that alone. So I think we can go home now. But hey, no, we're going to continue. All right, so that was all the negative side of tunnel vision that we, that we looked at last week. Now, Today, we are going to talk about the positive side of tunnel vision, because it's not all doom and gloom. So, so for the next few minutes, we are going to take a look into the life of David again, because when he, he, while he also suffered from negative tunnel vision, he was also blessed with, spirit, with spiritual positive, uh, positive tunnel vision. And positive tunnel vision, well, positive, good thing. It caused him to go from being a simple shepherd to one of the most respected men in Israel in a matter of minutes. And it was all because of his spiritual tunnel vision, his positive spiritual tunnel vision. Now, this morning, we're going to take a look at a story that we're all familiar with. Whether you grew up in church or not, we're going to be taking a look at the story of David and Goliath. How many have heard the story of David and Goliath? Great. We know that David... Fought a giant that nobody else wanted to fight, and he won. Great. We're not really interested in the outcome today because we're looking at the process that David, that David went through. And, and not, to, not to belittle the outcome, but it's the process that he went through along the way that we're going to explore. Now, again, like the other story, this story spans quite a few verses, so we're not going to read it all. However, I do encourage you to read the whole thing when you go home, because I assure you, it doesn't matter how many times you read this story, the Lord brings something else out, a new perspective, a new point, every time you read through this. It's like 50 or 60 verses. There's a lot of information in there, and there's a lot of application. So that's uh, the complete account in 1 Samuel 17. Now, all right, so when we think of David and Goliath, we think immediately what comes to my mind is a children's Bible story. But it's so much more than that. So we're going to find out that it's actually an incredible story of how positive tunnel vision can help shape your destiny. Now, here's the, here's the situation. The Israelites are at war with the Philistines, and David is actually not a part of the war at this time. David is in the field watching his father's sheep because that's what he did. He was, he was a shepherd. He wasn't a warrior at this time. He was a shepherd. So he's out in the field, and his father calls him and says, Hey, I want you to go bring food to your brothers because all of his other brothers were at war. So he takes the food over to his brothers, and we're going to, we're going to pick it up in verse uh, 25 of 1 Samuel 17. So David, his father tells him to bring food to his brothers who are at war, and David discovers something upon his arrival. And this is what he discovers in verse 25. He says, have you seen the giant? He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife. This must be a really, really terrifying guy. The king is willing to give up his daughter. And the man's entire family will be exempt from paying taxes. How many of us would be lining up right now? 
I, I think it would have crossed my mind. Death or taxes, I can remove one of those out of the equation? Okay, all right. Well, we'll, 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 uh, we'll, we'll move on. So David asked the soldier standing nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending this defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Now, did you notice something? David doesn't emphasize the government. He doesn't emphasize the, the, uh, um, uh, the military's position or any other earthly status. His statement indicates something to us. It indicates his degree of tunnel vision. Just a little bit of insight into his degree of tunnel vision. How many of us, when we think of America, when we think of our country, think of our position, our standing with the Lord? It's not really the first thing that comes to mind. But when David addresses this situation, that addresses the armies of the nation, he says, wait, they are defiling the armies of my God. They were fighting for the Lord. So David got angry, not because the giant was opposing the army, but because the giant was opposing the Lord's chosen people. Now, when the giant came out to taunt the Israelites, he was out there making fun of their God. For the rest of the men there in the Israelite army that day, they were afraid to oppose the giant because they allowed their negative tunnel vision to hinder their victory. Now, remember what we said last week. We said negative tunnel vision causes us to make decisions based only upon what is directly in front of us. It limits our ability to make good decisions based on the whole picture because we don't see the whole picture. We only see what's directly in front of us. And the Israelite army suffered from negative tunnel vision. But David came in and things changed. Not because David was any more qualified or more trained, because if you know the story, David was underqualified. He was undertrained. And in, in all senses of the word, he would not even be allowed to walk onto the battlefield in this day and age. And he wasn't back then either. He had to fight for it. So... David was, wasn't any more qualified than any of the trained warriors, but because of his tunnel vision, he was able to advance. And you'll see what I mean in a second. So David gets angry that no one is doing anything about this loudmouth, disrespectful giant who's, who's totally disrespecting the Lord and doing it publicly. And, and this one giant is keeping an entire army at bay. And here comes this little shepherd boy who, who everyone just, you know, if you read, if you read the text, it, it, they, they, they make fun of him saying, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be with the sheep. You have no business being here. You're going to get hurt. You know, this was not David's wheelhouse. This is not where he belonged. But David when he saw what was happening, he started to get angry. And he decides if nobody else is going to do anything, if nobody else is going to stand up for the Lord, I'm going to be the example. And I'm going to do it. Now, let me just ask one question. Do you think David was fearful of his life at this moment? We, we, do, we don't know, but I'm not going to answer that just yet. You'll, you'll find out in a second. So he tells Saul that he wants to fight Goliath. And of course, he's met with opposition because he's too small. He's not adequately trained. He's underqualified. And now, how many of us have found ourselves ever in a position where you're told that you, you don't qualify for a job? You're, you're too weak. You're, you're too immobile. Whatever, whatever the case is, but you do not qualify for whatever you feel that the Lord has called you to do. If I stopped when people told me that I wasn't qualified to pastor here, I wouldn't be here. Those of you who know the, the backstory, which we're not going to get into, it, I was told so many times flat out, you will not pastor there you are not qualified to pastor there. God doesn't call us because we're qualified. He's not going to give you a mission that you are physically capable of doing on your own. He's going to call you to do something supernatural. Things that are, that are beyond your physical comprehension because that is the only way that he can shine. 
That is the only way that he can be made known throughout the land. David was accepting the challenge from the Lord. He was accepting this challenge from the Lord to do something that was beyond his physical ability. And everybody knew it, and everybody was reminding him of it. But that didn't stop David, because at this point in time, his tunnel vision was a positive tunnel vision. He didn't see anything else but Jesus. Well, the Lord. He didn't see anything else but the Lord. And when, we, when our eyes are focused on the Lord, it doesn't matter what we come up against. Because we, we, don't, we don't see the enemy attacking on, coming from the side. We don't see him coming up against us. But when we're focused on the Lord and we are making tracks in the, in the direction that the Lord wants us to go to, we don't, have to take, we don't have to worry about the enemy on our right and on our left. Because Jesus sets up that fortress. The Lord sets up that fortress about us. When you pray, when you pray, you've heard us pray before, cover them, uh, surround them with your hedge of protection. There is that protection that surrounds you as a child of the king when you are moving forward. That doesn't mean that that everything's always going to be great. You know, there's still things along the way that, that could trip you up, but the Lord protects you when he calls you. All right, so this is the same kind of opposition that David was up against. But how did, how, did he how did he respond? We know he eventually fought the giant because we know the end of the story. But we're not really interested at the end, as I said before. It's the journey that's more important right now. So how does he respond when he's told that he can't do something that he knows that the Lord wants him to do? We're going to pick it up in verse 32. It says, don't worry about the Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. How many times have you been in a position where you say, hey, listen, I know I may not be qualified, and you may think I can't do it, but I want to do it anyway. There's a, there's a, a saying that I've heard uh, out and about where uh, they say, um, those who say that it can't be done should get out of the way for those that are doing it. I think I, I may have messed that up. But in any case, don't say that something's impossible when God is, in, when God is directing you. But Saul says, don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy and he's a man of war since his youth. David knew what he was up against before he ever approached Saul. He knew about this guy. David persisted. David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. He's been taking care of his father's sheep and goats. Okay, well that will prepare you for war. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. Okay, we're getting a little better here. If I have done this to both lions and bears, I will do it again to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied, again, God. He's defied the armies of the living God. He wasn't fighting for man. He was fighting for God. Verse 37, he said, and this is, this is why I believe that David was not fearful for his life, because of what verse 37 says. He says, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from the Philistine. The same God who protected me from the lion and the bear is the same God who's going to protect me from this Philistine. That's not somebody who's going into battle saying, I hope I can, I hope I can, I hope I can. Or I think I can, I think I can. This is saying, listen, God wants me to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to come out victorious. In his mind, he has already won the battle. He's already won the battle in his mind because his faith 
is so strong in his God because he's already been through the lion. He's already been through the bear. He's already been through these difficult things. And because he knew, because he knew that God took him out of that, those situations, he took that same faith onto the battlefield. When, when the lion and the bear, you say, well, okay, it's a, it's a lion and bear. He can, he can figure something out, you know, but this guy, he's got a, he's got a sword in our day and age. You know, he's coming at me with an M16. You know, what can, what can I do? There's nothing else I can do. You know, everybody else is shaking in their boots. And this guy, David comes up and he says, listen, I don't fight for myself and I'm not fighting for you. I'm fighting for God. He He's the one who's called me. He's the one who sent me. So I won already. I won already. When God calls you to do something in your life, no matter how ridiculous it may sound, you don't have to know all the physics. You don't have to know the physics. The physics were against David here. Not just the physics. Everybody around him. Not one person stood with David. Not one But when David stood on that battlefield, it was David and God. That's all we need. That's all we need. Because that's the majority. Whenever God is on your side, whenever God gives you a mandate, it's up to you to follow that mandate. It's up to you to continue to move in the direction that he's called you to move in. Amen, Pastor. That's good preaching. David never did what the Lord was asking him to do before. He never, ever fought a man that we know of in Scripture. But because of what the Lord had enabled him to do in previous situations, his tunnel vision in this situation was this. The Lord is going to make me victorious, so let me at him. The Lord is going to make me victorious, so I'm moving on. So Saul lets him do it. In, uh, what is it, the last part of verse 37. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead. Basically, Saul's saying, hey, it's your funeral. It's your funeral. It's it, it, No skin off my back. Go ahead. So he said, may the Lord be with you. So Saul lets him do it. He even tries to give him his armor. And as it turns out, it's too heavy for David, so David turns it down. Instead, he goes and grabs his hand grenades and his machine gun and his landmines, and he says, why didn't you try this before? Yeah. David does something a little out of the ordinary. He does something that you wouldn't expect. In verse 40, it says this. He said he picked up, he goes to the stream. Like my stream? This is my stream. It's blue. So he goes to the stream, and he picks up. He picks up five smooth stones, and he puts them in his pouch. I'll use my pocket. Picks up five smooth stones from a stream and puts them in a shepherd's bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff and his sling, he prepared for defeat and started across the valley to meet his demise. It said he put the stones in his pack and he went out to meet the Philistine. He prepared to fight. That's what David did. David didn't prepare for battle thinking, I might be able to do this. I might possibly be able to defeat defeat this giant. He prepared knowing, not that he could possibly win, but that he couldn't possibly lose. Because he fought with the Lord by his side. Now, David picked up five smooth stones... And went into battle. He's, he's coming up against a guy with a sword and full body armor. And, and you, you would think that instead of five smooth stones, any, any normal person would say, hey, let's, let's get a big rock. Let's get this big rock and we're just going to go up and bash him on the head. Because, hey, that gets it done nice and quick, and, and, and it's done. You know what the odds are of taking this little stone and, and, and hitting, hitting somebody? Right where it hurts, 
that uh, right where it makes the most uh, most uh, the only exposed vital area the odds of that are extremely slim extremely slim but when we're left to our own devices when we're left to make decisions on our own and and we we think on our own that, hey, I know how to accomplish this. I know how to get the job done. I'm going to go out there with this big rock and I'm going to hit him over the head. This is how we think. But this is how God thinks. This is crude and, and, and inaccurate. You don't get any distance. I probably couldn't hit the back of the room with this. The Lord had a precise method for him to accomplish this. But if David, using his own human thinking, would have said, hey, I'm just going to go in there, I'm going to make the rules, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in there with the weapon of my choice, do you think he would have come out victorious? Sometimes when the Lord starts talking to us and starts laying out his plan for our lives, when he gives us the next step, or he gives us a couple of steps ahead where we need to be, it's important for us to listen to everything that he says and follow his, follow his plan every step of the way according to the way that he dictates because we wind up making stupid choices like this. And this would have, this would have met David's death. This would have meant David, David was not going to come back victorious because God called him to pick up a pebble and he picked up the boulder. This boulder may have a whole lot more weight to it. I'm going to put it down for that very reason. But it can't accomplish. An entire army armed with boulders can't accomplish what God can accomplish with a pebble. Because God didn't call him to carry a boulder onto the field. God called him to take up his sling and his stone. Let's read on verse 41. He said, Goliath walked out toward David with a shield bearer ahead of him. Sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy, I am a dog, he roared to David, or am I a dog, rather, that you came to me, that you come to me with a stick. And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I will give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. So, Goliath is just taunting him. Goliath is saying, listen, you, you, what is this, a joke? You're coming at me with no body armor, no sword. All you have is that, is that little sling and stones. What am I, a dog? Because Goliath wasn't at all in tune. Obviously, he was fighting against the Lord, but he obviously didn't know that God had a plan and that he was about to breathe his last. Verse 45, David responded. David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied, today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you. I'm going to cut off your head, and then I'm going to give, your de uh, give uh, the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. David went in there fighting for God. He went in fighting for to uphold the Lord's honor. Verse 47, and everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with the sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. I don't care what you're going through in your life today. It doesn't matter how small or how big your Goliath is today. You need to remember what David said right here. He said, I don't come at you with a sword and a spear because this is the Lord's battle and I give it to him. It's up to him how we come out of this battle. And if he sent me in, 
And he's equipped me. I'm going to come out victorious. So do I believe David was in fear of his life? I don't believe for one second David was fear for his life. Because first off, he had to fight to get to the battlefield. How many are going to fight for the opportunity to die? Very few of us would be in that, in that position. But he's made it clear on numerous occasions here that he's fighting for the Lord. He put the Lord first and the Lord was going to protect him. So how do we know David's mindset wasn't that he couldn't possibly lose? Unlike the Israelite army at the time, he didn't suffer from negative tunnel vision. But he still had tunnel vision. The difference is his tunnel vision was focused right where it needed to be. Focused on the Lord. Focused on the Lord and his directive from the Lord. David had such tunnel vision that all he could see was the Lord making him victorious. So there was no need to react in a way that would contradict this. So he went in with a boldness. And while the rest of the army was focused on the problem, David was focused on the solution. While the, rest of the, while the rest of the army was focused on the negative, David was focused on the victory. David went into the battle victorious, and he left the battle victorious. The rest of the army was already defeated, and that's why they didn't step on the battlefield. They knew what they had to do. They knew what they had to accomplish. But because they knew that it might hurt, because they knew that there was a possibility that they could lose their life, because they knew... I'm really going to Because they knew that, that they could not do it on their own, that's where they stopped. Because they were focused on the negative. But David didn't go in there looking at the negative. He knew the problem. He prepared to address the problem. But he went in there knowing that he could not lose with the Lord by his side. Now, what are the lasting effects of tunnel vision? Well, negative tunnel vision causes us to have bad judgment, causes us to have a lack of productivity. Negative tunnel vision is living defeated. Now, positive tunnel vision, on the other hand, Positive tunnel vision, keeping your eyes focused on the direction that the Lord has given you. Keeping your mind focused on the Lord. Remember when we talked about um, Peter walking out on the water. He asked the Lord to call him out onto the water. When Jesus called him out, as long as he kept his eyes on the Lord, as long as his tunnel vision was focused on what it needed to be, he stayed afloat. And he wound up being the only human being, the only man other than Jesus to ever walk on water. But the moment, the moment that he stepped outside of that positive tunnel vision, the moment that he took his eyes off the Lord, he began to sink. So negative tunnel vision leads us to bad judgment, lack of productivity, a life of defeat. Positive tunnel vision, staying focused on the Lord gives us good judgment, Good productivity, and it allows us to walk in victory. It puts us in a place where when we go into a trial, we don't say, Lord, I don't think I can deal with this. I, I, I don't know what to do in this situation. I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just not going to deal with it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ignore it. I'm going to just make like it's not even there. You know, I, that's, the, that's the negative side. But when we're walking victoriously, we go into these difficult situations. And it's not a superhuman thing. It's a faith thing. We're not superhumans. But we have faith in our Savior. When we go into a difficult situation, we don't go in saying, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't, I don't know. We say, no, Lord, what do you want me to do? Do you notice a big difference there? When you go in already defeated, already negative, your mind is so focused on all the possible negatives. When if you go in and you say, hey, Lord, what do I do in this situation? 
it leaves it open for him to speak to you. It leaves your mind clear of not all the what ifs, but God, how is this going to happen? Guide and direct my footsteps. I know so many people who go into situations and they have, they have fictitious arguments in their head with people. And they already know the outcome of the conversation that has not ever taken place. Because they go in and they start saying, well, I know, it, we're all human, so this has happened to me too. I will say that. But they'll be doing something and they'll say, you know what? I really want to tell this person this, but I know when I say this, this person is going to come back and they're going to say this. And then, and then you know what? I'm going to say this. And then they're going to say this. And, and, and then they're going to come back at this. And, and you're having an argument with yourself. There's no possible good outcome out of that. When we just say, hey, you know what? I need to deal with this situation. Lord, how do, how do I do this? Stop spending so much time arguing with yourself over fictitious things and surrender it to the Lord. Ask him how to, how to do it. Ask him how he wants you to per- proceed in, in something. So, so how do we walk in this positive, in this positive tunnel vision? Colossians 3, 2 says, think about things of heaven, not things of earth. Focus our mind on things, the positive things. This is not mind control. What this is saying is don't focus on the negative. The world tells us just the opposite. Prepare for the worst and hope for the best. That is not biblical. That's not at all biblical. We don't prepare for the worst and hope for the best. We go in knowing that we're going to come out victorious or we lost the battle already. So think about things of heaven, not things on the earth. Philippians 4.8 says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Those are the kind of things that we need to dwell on. Those are the kind of things that we need to, when we see something good in people, point it out. Say, you know what? That's great. You, you did a great job. My, I, I just... Um, uh, last night, Sarah and I were talking. Uh, Zach goes up to, to Sarah the other day, and uh, and he said, um, he goes, "Good job, mommy. That was a that was a great job." And she said, "I couldn't believe he said that." I said, "Why?" I said, "Because that's what we tell him all the time. The people around you will start to pick up these traits. The people around you will notice that you're pointing out the positive." And not just focused on the negative. Because you live with positive tunnel vision. You're focused on the Lord. You're thinking about positive things. You're, 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 you're thinking about, about things that are, that are true. Not, not talking about what, what you think this person lied. I think this person lied to the boss. And, and I don't know what's going to happen. So, so don't tell anybody. You know, we, you're gossiping. You're, you're talking about this, this situation that doesn't involve you, by the way. But it's not thinking on what's pure, what, what's honorable, what's true, what is right, what is lovely, what is pure. When we get together with the guys, what are we talking about? Are we talking about things that are pure or things we shouldn't be? I, all the time I have people telling me, well, you know, you're a pastor. What does that mean? I'm human. If you don't say something around me that you wouldn't say around, around somebody else or you have to say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, whatever. Whatever you do to the least of these, you do to the Lord. If we would be embarrassed at our speech, if the Lord was standing there, we have no business saying it. If we, if we would be embarrassed by what we watch on TV or listen to on the radio and we couldn't have Jesus sitting right next to us, That's a problem. That's an issue. We need to live in, in that positive tunnel vision. 
We need to be focused on the Lord because when we're focused on the Lord, do you, do you realize just that in the same way that the negative tunnel vision blocks out all the positive, positive tunnel vision blocks out the negative. And that's how God designed us. He designed us to worship him, to live holy lives, to focus on him. I'm going to ask us all to bow our heads. I don't know everyone here today. But if you have never asked Jesus to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior, I want to give you that opportunity right now. Before we go on any further, I want to give you the opportunity to make the best decision that you could possibly make in your entire life. And that is to surrender your life to the Lord. The word tells us that he stands at the door of our heart and he knocks. But it's up to us whether or not we open ourselves up to him. And this same, this same God that David served, this same God that brought David through the battle is the same God that wants to take you through the battle this morning. Whatever you're going through this morning, the God of the Bible, the God of David is the same God that wants to come into your life, be your Lord and Savior, and help you through the trials of this life. If that's you this morning and you want to ask Jesus to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior, I'm simply going to ask you to signify by, by lifting up your hand and I will pray with you. All right then. For the rest of us who are here, this altar call is simple. This is the most important time of our service because this is where the application comes in. We talked this morning about the benefits of positive tunnel vision, the benefits of focusing ourselves on the Lord. We make better choices, we're more productive. Most importantly, we live victoriously. If you know that in your life you are not living victoriously, if you know that in your, in your life right now there's something that's hindering you from reaching that next level in your relationship with the Lord, if there's something that's causing you to live in that place where you have negative tunnel vision and you want Jesus to remove those blinders and you want positive tunnel vision to where he blocks out the negativity and you are now focusing on the positive, what's pure, lovely, honorable. And you want to make that change this morning. I'm, st I'm just going to ask you to stand to your feet as I am, I am standing right now. Because this is something that we, that we as Christians have to deal with every single day of our life. We have a choice. We have a choice. We can choose negative tunnel vision or positive tunnel vision, but one way or the other, we live with tunnel vision. And I don't know about you, but I want to I wanna live positively. And the reason why I ask you to stand is because we are making a public declaration. We are saying, Lord, you gave your life on Calvary. You made a public declaration so that we can be free. Lord, I stand making a public declaration for you. Because what, what we're saying is that we are simply human. And we suffer from the same things that some of the greatest Bible characters suffered from. In the negative tunnel vision. And what we want for him to do this morning is, is convert that. We want him to convert that negative tunnel vision into positive tunnel vision. So that we can live a victorious life.
Father, I thank you for each person standing here this morning. Lord, because each person standing here is making a public statement. Lord, it's not a statement of saying, oh, look at me, how terrible I am, because none of us, none of us are anything but human. None of us are anything but human. Lord, none of us are any greater than David was. Lord, it doesn't mean that we're involved in any great sin, Father, but what it does mean is that we know, we know that from this moment on, we want to strive to live with positive tunnel vision. Lord, we want to strive to keep our eyes focused on you and not the situation around us. Lord, I ask you right now for each person who's standing and each person who wanted to stand and for some reason did not, Father. Lord, I ask you to meet them right where they're at right now. Lord, remove the the negative blinders from their eyes. Lord, and replace it. Just like you take our filthy rags and replace it with a robe of righteousness. Lord, we ask you to take our negative blinders and put on your positive spiritual blinders right now. Lord, let us not leave here the same way that we came in. Trusting in ourself. Focused on the negative around us. But Father, let us leave here focused on you. Lord, let what is true and honest and pure and holy be on our lips. Lord, fill our minds with only the things of your spirit. Lord, help us to be more productive. Help us to make better choices in our life. Father, help us to live victoriously. Lord, we know that we want to live victoriously, but we can't if we're buried in our negativity, Father. So, Lord, we surrender. We surrender our, our, our negative blinders to you right now and we ask you to return in return give us our positive our positive tunnel vision and as we walk out of this place today let us walk in your victory we thank you Lord we worship you in your name we pray amen I'm just going to leave the altars open. If you would like prayer for anything specific, I'm going to be available. If not, have a great day. Have a great week. And whatever you do, think about what's pure and honest and holy. Because that's the only way that you're going to live victoriously. And for those who are staying for the meeting in the cafe, we'll, we'll be back there after we're done praying. Thank you. Just tell me where, uh, where, when I'm standing the best. Hold on, here we go. Let me start this. <coughs> Move up, back. Welcome, Hope, uh, Merry Christmas, Hope Center. I'm Pastor Vince. Many of you know me because it was only a few years ago when my wife Sarah and I were members right here at Hope Center. Now you normally see us from time to time during come what. What? Back? Well, now you're like, actually, because you look thinner. Merry Christmas, Hope Center. I'm Pastor Vince. Many of you know me because it was only a few years ago. What? You have to stand so that you're coming up that reef where it looks like you've got a reef and now your head. There you go. Well, now we are pastoring in Hackettstown, New Jersey, which is about an hour and 15 minutes straight west of you. I've been...
I've been lead pastor at Calvary for two years now. And since our last update back in February, a lot has taken place here. The